This is the Bentley tutorial series for Engineers Without Borders, and welcome to the Modeling Demands presentation. This presentation will review how to apply community water demands to a distribution model, manipulate design alternatives, create and compute scenarios, and view system results in various formats. A demand is also known as usage, consumption, or loading, and the main purpose of a water distribution network is to provide potable water to meet demands. Water usage rates and patterns vary greatly depending on climate, culture, and local industry. Many communities won't have meters to directly record system data, so your chapters will need to rely on other estimation tools. In general, a demand pattern relates water use to time of day. A diurnal curve describes changes in demand in a 24-hour period, reflecting times when people are using more or less water than the average daily value. The pattern below is a representative residential pattern. It shows a diurnal demand pattern that might be represented in both the stepwise and continuous fashion. In stepwise demand patterns, demand multipliers are assumed to remain constant over the duration of the pattern time step. In a continuous pattern, on the other hand, refers to a pattern that is defined independently of the pattern time step, and intermediate time steps are determined by interpolation. Engineers Without Borders approaches demand assessment holistically. Projects will need to address social, technical, environmental, and financial constraints. Demand should be based on the number and type of users to be served, and the design objectives must include projections for the future, since water supply enhancement fosters growth and brings more people. The modeling engineer must have both a historical perspective and a future focus. So be sure to consider the population growth rate and seasonal influences on water use, and it's helpful to determine an estimate for the system's average daily demand. There is data available for initial estimates of domestic per capita water consumption. This table is one among others that can be used to calculate estimated demand per tab, depending on the type of collection point. There are a few different features within water gems that are useful when modeling demands over time. Scenarios and alternatives are water gems features that are helpful for analysis of many alternative situations. Within a single model, you can set up different data sets and create scenarios by piecing together those data sets. For example, you can have a model set up to reflect the current system, then create two scenarios, one including the current demand and one with the projected demand. The user can create three different types of scenarios. By default, new models start with base scenarios, and in water gems, child scenarios can be created from parent scenarios. The child will default to inherit properties from the parent, which can then be edited, and this is useful since new scenarios are often created with slight changes from the original. Extended period simulations are used to model the system over time, including time-dependent demands. The hydraulic time steps of an extended period simulation are actually steady-state simulations strung together, similar to the way a film projector flashes a series of images in sequence to create a moving picture. Many inputs are required for an EPS simulation, so it's highly recommended that you run your model in the steady state to make sure the first few EPS runs are more successful. The duration of the simulation can be any length of time, most commonly it's 24 hours. If you're modeling short-term emergency situations, it may be helpful to model a few hours, and if you're modeling for water quality, the duration of several days is more appropriate. Now, we'll return to a water gem system and walk through adding demands to our network. In the Water Gems Basics tutorial, we reviewed uploading a background file. Here, it can be useful for placing features for scale. Since I have my system all set up, I'll hide the background layer for easier visibility. We're starting with a similar system to what we built in the Pipeflow tutorial. Now, the network consists of a reservoir connected by pipes to two junctions. First, we'll add a demand to the junction J1. Click on it to open the junction properties, then click under Demand Collection and click the ellipsis. You can assign demands to this node by entering data here. The simplest option is to enter a demand that is constant over time. You just type in a flow rate and choose Fixed under Pattern, and the demand of this node will stay constant. We'll put a fixed demand here of 260 meters cubed per day. However, for most communities, the demand varies with time of day. To reflect that, you can create a demand pattern. We'll add a demand pattern to J2. Do that by clicking on the ellipsis under Pattern to open the Pattern Manager. 
I've already created one, but if you're starting, create a new hydraulic pattern by clicking on Hydraulic and then the New button and giving it a name that describes it. Next to Pattern Format, we have the stepwise pattern chosen. Notice the default start time is midnight and the starting multiplier is zero. Now these inputs are set up so you can assign different demands to different times of day. The time is measured in hours from start time and the default is midnight. The demands are measured as a multiplier for the average daily usage. We will use the design pattern assumption which was employed by Northeastern University in their Honduras project. They developed this as a representative pattern of their community's usage and use it as a basis for design. Note they didn't base their demands on a multiplier of 1, but instead for the accumulated daily flow volume to add up to 100%. The demand is 15% from 6 to 8, changes to 5% from 8 to 4, back to 15% from 4 to 6, and returns to 0. A few tips to avoid common errors here. The first time in the pattern after the start time cannot be zero. The starting multiplier has its own box at the top, and then the first change in demand would be entered in the first row in the table. Also, the last multiplier in your pattern must match the starting multiplier, so make sure that the bottom value is the same as the starting number up top. Close that box when your pattern is complete. Now you can choose the pattern you just created from the drop-down list. Remember, our numbers are entered as multipliers applied to a base demand. For Northeastern's community, it had about 400 people and their projected demand in 25 years was about 17,000 gallons per day, which is equivalent to 64,400 liters per day, or slightly more than 160 liters per day per person, and that accounts for both household and irrigation use. As a reminder, you can change the units if you need to, right click, and anything you need will be listed. So now we have our demand pattern set up on that junction. Now we'll set up an EPS, or Extended Period Simulation, and explore scenarios and alternatives by testing two different size pipes in different demands, and we'll see how these changes affect the system over time. To set up our scenarios, go to the folder icon or the Analysis menu, then Scenarios. Right now we have the base scenario. Double-click on it to view its properties. The scenario is made up of various alternatives that represent facets of design information. The key premise of scenario management is that the alternative facets of data can be maintained individually, then mix and match easily to set up various hydraulic scenarios to be compared. We haven't created any other optional alternatives yet, so this scenario is set to all the base alternatives. Let's create a child scenario. We'll call it 24-hour EPS existing. You can click to open its properties. You can see the I next to the alternatives showing the data is inherited. We'll make this scenario an EPS, not a steady state. So go to the analysis menu, then calculation options. I've already created the 24 hour EPS. You would select the steady state EPS solver and create a new one. Open its properties and under time analysis type, change it to EPS. Now that we have the EPS set, we'll set up other alternatives. You can view the alternatives by clicking on the Alternatives icon or by going to the Analysis menu, then Alternatives. Expand the physical category. If you click on Base Physical, you can see the pipe diameters are listed as 50 millimeters and 15 millimeters. It's important that you have Base Physical selected when you make a new one to ensure the physical alternatives inherits the base properties we've already assigned. We'll create a new alternative and name it Larger Pipes. Type in the values of the diameters of 100 millimeters here for P1 and 50 millimeters for P2. Remember, any changes made in this table will be unique to this alternative. We'll also expand our demand alternatives. We'll create a new alternative, and looking at the demands on J2, we'll edit the demand collection. We can increase the base demand to be 70 meters cubed per day, as if the household increased its occupation. Then we'll rename it larger household. We've set up the alternatives, now we can return to Scenarios. In the existing scenario, double-click. We'll leave the base physical and base demands, and choose 24-hour EPS under Calculation Options. Now we'll create another child scenario, and name it 24-hour EPS Increase Demand. Leave the inherited base physical alternative, choose larger household under Demand, and choose 24-hour EPS as the calculation option. There are other combinations you can create using the different physical and demand alternatives. Our scenarios are all set to be computed. You can choose which scenario is displayed in the drawing window from the drop-down menu in the top left toolbar. 
The drawing and feature properties will stay consistent with whichever scenario is displayed here. This is a good thing to keep in mind when you're editing properties from the property grid. Always make sure this displays the scenario you want to edit. To compute, you can run each scenario individually by selecting it here, then clicking the green compute arrow. Or you can compute multiple scenarios at once by opening up scenarios and then you'll see another green compute arrow. Click on the black arrow next to it and select batch run. We have some blue notifications down here. Notifications can be warnings about potential issues with your model or error messages identifying something that's preventing water jumps from solving it. It looks like we had negative pressure during the run. Let's click on the notification. You can see the related node is highlighted in the drawing. We'll double click on J1 and scroll down to see the results. You can see a negative pressure there. So to double check, let's open a profile of our system. It looks like the reservoir elevation is set to be 50 meters when it should be 150 meters. So let me open up the properties and raise it up to 150 as it should be. This is a good example of the beauty of inheritance in scenarios. We want this change to be reflected in all of our setups, including both of our scenarios. Because our scenarios are children of the base, we can make this change in the base scenario and it will be reflected in all of them. Definitely save some time as compared to individually changing the value for each scenario. We'll try and compute these scenarios again. And we have no notifications. Nice. To see what happened at specific points in your system over time, you can right-click on Elements, then select Graph. You can select both P1 and P2 by clicking on one, then holding down the Control button and clicking on the other one. You can right-click and Graph. You can select multiple or individual scenarios to be shown on the graph and choose which features you want. So let's look at the velocity through both pipes for both of our 24-hour EPS scenarios. So once the graph appears, you can see for P2, which is between the two demand nodes, a red line is for the existing scenario, and the blue line is for the velocity with increased demands. It shows that the velocity is faster with increased demands, which makes sense. This is a good way to visualize how results vary over time, which works well when comparing a limited amount of elements. There is another option for viewing these pipe properties in flow over time. Make sure the scenario toolbar is on either of our 24-hour EPS scenarios, and if you open up the pipe flex table, find the flow column. To display spark lines, you can right-click on the column, then select Show Spark Lines. You can adjust the spark line settings, like the value ranges and highlight values and color that are outside of a specified range. The spark line feature is used to be able to see results over time for multiple elements. The display is like a miniature graph of results over time. Now you know the basics of adding demands and demand patterns, using alternatives and scenarios, and viewing some results. We'll continue to use these features and more throughout the series. Now we'll go through some assessment questions. A diurnal curve describes changes in demand in a 24-hour period, reflecting times when people are using more or less water than the blank value, either the maximum daily, average daily, maximum hourly, or average hourly. And the answer is average daily. Number two, an extended period simulation, or EPS, is used to evaluate system performance over which period of time? Either one hour, 24 hours, one week, or any specified amount of time. And an EPS can be used for any specified amount of time. And finally, number three, I want to test my model with a different length of pipe and compare the flow changes to the original design. What should I do? So first, you would create a new scenario with a physical alternative including a longer length and make it an EPS. Then conduct a batch run of the original design and the longer pipe design and view results to compare the flow changes. Thanks for watching and please join us for the next tutorial.